habits on the bottom. Oh, um, no, I don't really know. Yeah, email to me, yeah, 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 please take this.
Okay, guys. Uh, I need all of your attention now because we're going to go through um, the slides on action recognition in the first part. I'm going to skip uh, part of it that was taught in the last uh, in the last uh, in the last year. Then I'm going to remove the slow slides from the, uh, from what will appear in the. Actually, I think that's already updated in uh, what appears on the QM Plus already. But I will uh, have a second uh, check. Okay, I have updated the uh, motion tracking today, uh, so that would be that should be okay. Uh, in the that will happen in the first hour. In the second hour, first we're going to have a revision for the exams. Uh, I will do the first half hour and Tony will do the other one. Before we, st before we start, I want to tell you something else completely uh, irrelevant. Is that um, um, for those of you that are um, uh, UK residents, there are uh, uh, opening positions for uh, PhD. So if you have uh, interest and connection with uh, some uh, uh, lecturers, professors uh, on a topic that it is interesting to you, there is a good opportunity to you know, uh, make an application and uh, go in that direction. That's all I have to, to say about that as well. Um, good. Now, today we're going to do action recognition. And it is again, it is, a, and we're going to see it as a generalization of recognition in static uh, uh, images. We have seen object recognition, we have seen image categorization, we have seen object detection. We are going to see the same things now in the context of uh, 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 recognition of uh, uh, actions. The difference is the one was in static images, the other one is on image sequences. So we have an extra dimension. And pretty much, uh, everything else remains uh, uh, the same. Several methodologies that are um, are just generalization from the 2D domain of images to the 3D domain of image sequences. So instead of having descriptors that are two-dimensional, you have descriptors that are three-dimensional. We're going to see all of those things uh, uh, in a while. Uh, good. We're going to see uh, two things. We're going to see template classification methods and we're going to see part-based action localization. We are not going to see about pose estimation and objects. I'm just going to spend one second in, in that. So actions uh, have several, several, several dimensions. Uh, and the main thing that you need to remember from this uh, uh, slide is that it has a temporal dimension. It is a transition from a state to the other. It is something that it is evolving in time. There are several of things that you want to consider if uh, you want to analyze it in a fine-grained uh, manner. So who is doing it? What's the state of the actor? Is it changing? Uh, what are the objects uh, that are interact? What are uh, um, how things are changing? What is the purpose of the action? Several levels. Okay, we're going to see a very simple subcategory in which we are going to analyze and we are going to detect and we are going to localize <coughs> actions uh, which are atomic motion patterns so for example that have a clear cut say, trajectory so things like somebody is falling, uh, hugging, uh, kissing, uh, opening a door uh, things like that Okay, uh, this is a little bit, this is a simpler problem than recognition of activity which is something or events which are longer term um, um, 
happenings. Uh, they have a longer temporal dimension. They can have a larger variability. For example, uh, a football game or changing the changing the tire of a car or cooking a meal. It can be all of those things can happen with many, 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 many different ways and much larger variation than in how many ways you can perform. You can break the edge or you can lift the spoon or you can fall. You can fall in many different ways. But certainly there is less variation in how people, how people fall than, uh, for example, a traffic accident. Is that clear? These are general uh, um, um, concepts that you that you need to consider and that they are and that are independent of the methodologies that we are going to look into. We are going to focus now on actions, which are the elementary uh, things. Uh, there are several applications for uh, uh, action recognition. So, for example, it's about for interfaces like recognize uh, uh, gestures, hand gestures. Uh, there is, and we're going to see, uh, we talked about uh, facial expression recognition, so for example, for uh, uh, emotions, uh, uh, gesture recognition for human computer interaction, human robot interaction. And in general, the world is, uh, well, the world is not around us is not static. Things are happening and they are having a temporal dimension. So uh, all the, uh, uh, and you can see that in the amount of uh, 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 sequences and video that are uploaded in YouTube, that are uh, uh, the, uh, broadcasted uh, on TV, there is a huge need for analyzing this kind of um, uh, information. And there are several ways of uh, uh, analyzing uh, and identifying action, so how things move, by the pose itself, by the, ho by the objects that you hold, by the nearby objects. So for example, the action of throwing can be identified by that. Both the pose and also the things that are around it. We're going to see some features now. Uh, and the first, which is uh, and uh, the first type of methodologies was this template classification methods. The first direction of uh, uh, research tried to do the following. Tried to go from an image sequence of the pic, for example, somebody sitting down, okay, in a 2D representation that somehow summarized all those, all the sequence, it summarized it into one image, okay. And then this image would summarize what would happen in the image sequence, okay? And it could be subsequently used within any of the object recognition methodologies that we have, uh, or uh, 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 image recognition methodologies that we have seen in the uh, previous lectures. So once you have a way of compressing an image sequence into one image, okay? then you can apply image sequence recognition algorithms using the same methodologies that you use on image recognition methodologies. Okay. So the image recognition or the action recognition, what does it have? What does it have? Uh, you're given an image sequence and we want to recognize what is the action that appeared in this image uh, sequence. Okay. Is that clear? So and you can have several examples of people sitting down, several examples of uh, people standing up, several examples of people boxing, and these are the different categories, okay? And you can train a classifier then that can do the recognition, okay? Once you know how to go from image sequences into the uh, uh, representation, 2D representation. In this specific 2D representation, you can look at the paper if uh, you want. It's an old paper, but it is uh, uh, one uh, uh, clear uh, and interesting idea. So what it did is that it performed change detection so at each frame, it would subtract the frame from the previous frame. It would detect which pixels changed. Okay, those pixels they would have they would be assigned a very bright color uh, intensity, which means that they just changed. Okay, and that intensity would slowly in the next frames if they didn't change, it would slowly be reduced. So with this image sequence, this image now tells that this area here have changed very recently, and this one very much towards the past, which is something that uh, is understandable because the person was standing here and then slowly sat down, so those pixels here changed 
a long time ago. Okay. These are called the motion history images. You can use optical flow algorithm to estimate the motion between two subsequent frames. Okay. Optical flow, so you have a pixel and you have a vector that tells how things uh, change. Okay. <coughs> Uh, and then you can split it into different uh, uh, channels. So here you have the horizontal component and the vertical component. In this image, you have areas in which the optical flow vector points to the uh, left, to the right, sorry. This one uh, where it points to the, to the left, this one where it points to down, and this one where it points uh, up. Is it understandable? So this is about the horizontal component, and this is about the vertical component. This is areas where you have horizontal positive. This is where you have horizontal negatives. This is when you have vertical positive. This is when you have vertical negatives. Is it understandable? Clear? OK. And then what you, what, what you end up with is, at each pixel now, you have a you have four values, this value, this value, this value, and this value. And then you can apply any type of image classification <coughs> methodology to recognize the action. Because what you go is that you go from an image sequence, okay, and you go into these concise representations of the motion. Okay, and then you can apply image classification algorithms. We're going to see some uh, more things. You can represent motion by tracking points, by the algorithm, by the Lucas Canale, for example, method, or by any uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, tracker. So what you have is that you identify in the first frame some uh, uh, interesting points. Do you remember what the interesting points are? Who remembers? The salient points. For example, the corners. Okay. Or areas where the intensity, there is a lot of intensity variation. Okay. Are flat areas interest points or salient points? No. Okay. So they are usually localized in corners. They are localized in area like this, where you have a lot of uh, uh, intensity variation, for example, and things like that. Okay. Uh, good. And we have also an extension of the spatial interest points, which are corners in uh, space. Okay. Corners in the images into corners in time, where roughly speaking now, is locations in space and in time where motion changes. Okay, We're going to see that in a, a specific and a more detailed definition uh, uh, of an example of a special temporal interest point detector in the uh, next half hour. So I'm going to skip this okay, and do this as uh, well. Now, I'm going to describe now those feature classification methods, so methodologies that are using this type of representations or this type of representations. And we're going to see exactly what type of representations, but in any case, this type of template representations to recognize actions. Okay? So we're going to see then the action recognition as a classification problem, which means that we were going to have a lot of training samples of image sequences that depict people doing specific actions. Uh, for example, uh, drinking coffee, as is in the left hand in the left column. Okay. Uh, and the idea is to recognize, have a binary classifier, for example, that says, given an image sequence, is this action there or not? So return a zero or one, the binary classifier. Is that understandable? And there is an extension to that, in which you have a lot of training examples of different classes, and then you have a multi-class classification problem. Similar ideas. But let's say the two dimension, the two uh, class uh, case, uh, which is a little bit simpler. So you have a lot of training examples of people drinking coffee, and a lot of test samples of people drinking coffee again, or not drinking coffee, and you want the zero or one uh, uh, answer. Okay. Good. So what are we going? So what you remember what we did in, when we had the image categorization? So we had training images. Okay. Then we extracted features. Then for each image, we had the uh, label, okay, a zero or one, that is the category or not for each one, and then we trained the classifier, we had the classifier, and then during testing we had the testing image, we extracted the same features, 
very important. Uh, and we use a trained classifier to predict an answer like, for example, outdoors or indoors. Okay, outdoors, yes or no. Clear? Okay. Good. Do you remember when we had the special uh, pyramids in which we uh, uh, divided into different areas and then we calculated, we computed the histogram of uh, the features within each, uh, in which of the areas? Right? Do you remember that? Okay. So the histogram, for example, of safe descriptors or histogram of whatever type of uh, and the different resolutions, so for example, at this level and, at the, uh, and another level. So you had a histogram for this, a histogram for this, for this, for this, a histogram for the whole image, a histogram for each of the different areas. And then all of that, all those histograms would comprise a very large vector that would describe, would be the description of that, uh, of this image. Okay. So now the same thing, exactly the same thing, well exactly, very, very similar thing, we do in the case of the action, okay? But instead of making now and extracting um, uh, uh, a histogram at each frame, what we are doing is that we are having a volume, which is a sequence of images, okay? And we calculate a histogram of the features within all the volume, okay? Or within pyramids within that volume. So we break it into small pieces, small uh, cubes now, okay? And we have uh, this kind of decompositions. So this one is for the whole uh, cube, okay? And then we, uh, we compute the histogram here. Then we have another, another histogram for this part here, another histogram for this part here, another histogram for this, another histogram for this, another histogram for this, another histogram for this. Another histogram for this. So basically we have different breakups of the spatiotemporal volume now, all right? And we calculate histograms of features within that volume. Is it understandable? To whom is that clear? Yes. So we so alternate between breaking down in, into the time space for the time dimension then and the space dimension. Is that what means by temp2 and spatial 4? Yes, okay. Very uh, interesting uh, observation. So. Uh, there are several strategies for breaking up the volume and constructing the pyramid, okay? And these, uh, these ones are some examples that have been typically used, okay? So one is you compute one histogram for the whole volume. Another one is you compute a histogram for the first part and the histogram for the second part. So you have a temporal uh, uh, breakup. And here you have a spatial uh, 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 breakup. It's understandable. There are many different variations, and to all of them, uh, 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 okay, how you say that? And there is a trade-off, as was the case with the spatial pyramids. So, the coarser those things are, the more robust you are to the uh, localization. <coughs> okay. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the coarser they are, the more <coughs> robust, the more invariant you are to the localization. The more refined you are, the more uh, precise <coughs> you are in terms of localization. But the less uh, robust you are, if just the image will shift a little bit, or if the action will be performed here or will be performed here, it's understandable. Or it, if it will perform a little bit faster or a little bit slower. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, and this is a typical uh, uh, break up of, uh, of, of the cube. The exact is a matter of uh, engineering. So you have to try and see which one is the best, etc., etc. But these are, this is a typical one. Okay. And now, when you calculate a histogram, you calculate the histogram of what? So one thing that you could do is you could extract features special features at each frame, okay? And just com and just compute their histogram in that volume, so static features, okay? Is it understandable? So instead of averaging, uh, yeah, the histogram, yeah, you could calculate the, uh, you, you could have a bag of word, uh, 
uh, model or a histogram within each. You can you can do that for each frame, or you can do it at each uh, at each region. Well, you can extend and calculate the histogram not only on a single frame of static features, but not on a single frame, but over all frames. Okay, that's one way. Another way would be to well have. You could calculate the histogram now, not of uh, uh, both of static features, but you could calculate the histogram also of the optical flow fields. Okay? So what you have is that you have optical flow vectors. Well, you can do a quantization, either a hard quantization, or you can construct like uh, a vocabulary by clustering uh, the uh, in the same way that you constructed the visual voc vocabulary of texture of text of of, of, of uh, of, uh, uh, of texture, you can construct visual vocabulary of the motion items, right? So, and then you calculate the histogram of optical flow within the whole, uh, 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 within uh, volumes. Okay, good. Again, good. And then you have the histogram of the whole, the histogram of the partial histograms, and those histograms, and you can concatenate them, and that is your representation of the whole image sequence. Okay. And once you have a whole vector for the image sequence, for okay, then you can apply any uh, image, any uh, classifier to it. Okay. Good. Uh, <coughs> okay. The second one is to extract features, not densely. So, n not uh, so construct features, construct, construct histogram of features by examining not uh, uh, the feature at each possible location and constructing uh, basically the histogram by examining what is the feature here, what's the feature here, 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 at all possible locations, but doing it sparsely, not everywhere but only at so-called special temporal interest points, okay? In the same way, when we were talking about uh, image classification, we said that what we can do is that we can construct a histogram of the image by calculating the histogram of the features, either within uh, uh, densely, so at each pixel we had, a histo we, had the, we had a feature and we were calculating the histogram of those features, or we can extract features at sparse points, at interest points. Well, in the image sequence, we can extract the features at sparse points, which are the special temporal interest points, and roughly speaking, as I, as I say, are the uh, locations in space and time in which you have changes in, in uh, motion. There are corners in space and time. We're going to see exactly what this means in, in, in a while. Okay, is that clear? So these special temporal interest points are generalization of the uh, uh, Harris corner detector, for example, or interest point detectors in general. Okay, and then you can use whatever you want to, whatever classifier uh, you want to use. So you can use uh, uh, boosting uh, algorithms, you can use uh, SVM uh, 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 classifiers, whatever, whatever you want. Okay. Uh, Good. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now. Uh, what happens is that in the case that you want to uh, recognize actions such as drinking coffee, you're not going to have segmented uh, actions 
in which the camera is going to, in which only the action that you want to recognize is uh, depicted in it. You're going to have a lot of clutter. The clutter means irrelevant with respect to the task that we have in hand. Irrelevant information is contained. Clutter is uh, information that is irrelevant, that it is distracting from what we want to uh, uh, recognize. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what would, could be doing? What could we be doing? What we could be doing is we could extend the sliding window paradigm that we have to detect objects. So what we could do is that we would have uh, built a classifier in which we train with segmented in space and in time image sequences that depict only the action in question and in which you had a bounding box for example of the person that was doing the action like a drinking coffee you were depicting only you would have training examples of people that were uh, uh, drinking coffee okay and it would be the start and the end of the action and nothing else beyond beyond that is it understandable so now, no, so not somebody sitting there for half an hour and then drinking a little bit of coffee and then half an hour uh, of uh, irrelevant information and then say that this is my positive example. No, the positive example would be trimmed in time. In, uh, in time. Uh, right. And then what, what could you do? You could then go and do the same thing that you did. You could do a sliding window approach, right? So what you could do is that you could take now then the classifier, okay? And you could go into a given sequence like this for example, okay? But it would have, it could be very long. You can imagine this sequence, you can imagine this sequence as a space and time volume, okay? Like this room for example. And then you have your classifier which at each point examines a certain space-time cube like this, okay? So you could go extract features within that window, okay? Get it through your classifier, get a response. Move it. Move it, move it, move it, slide it through all the special temporal volume that it is your image sequence, okay? And get an answer at its special temporal location, okay? What was the problem that we had? What are the issues that we had to consider when we were doing a sliding window approach? Was the scale, for example, one issue, okay? So well, that means that you would have now to Apply it at different scales, okay, as well. All right, several different scales. You could scale the image sequence first and then apply it in that scale, okay. Only special scales, also temporal scales. What the different temporal scale uh, corresponds to? <laughs> faster or slower motion? Sorry? Faster or slower? Yes, faster or uh, 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 slower motion. I think this uh, AI is uh, <laughs> a bit creepy now with the, with the lights on the... Anyway, yeah, uh, it is exactly that. Faster or uh, uh, slower uh, uh, motion. Okay, now, we have a problem with that approach. And the problem with that approach is that it is very, very, very computational intensive. Okay, it is very, com it's hugely computational intensive because we have Imagine now that you have to apply, if you have to apply at L scales at special, at S scales in space, okay? And you have to slide through all possible now locations in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, in the, in the image, in the image sequence now, okay? Do we have something to write on the... Okay, so if you have n by n pixels and you have t frames, then the complexity is n squared times t, because you have to apply it at all different locations, times how many scales, s capital let's say, times temporal scales. Okay, and that's quite a lot. So there were several methodologies that we're trying to now address that problem and go and uh, uh, apply the detector that you had, not at all possible locations, but only at specific ones, at selected ones. One way of doing that would be to uh, detect now the keyframes using a hog detector at each uh, frame. So for example, you could first apply a detector 
at each frame, you would localize a key, uh, uh, a key frame. Then you would, and then you would, uh, uh, so you would have the scale, okay? So you would have the scale and the temporal and the, the temporal location. And then there you would apply. Then there you would put a window around it, space-time window around it, and there only you would apply your classifier. Okay, it's understandable. So basically, we break the problem in two different stages, and we have a fast uh, spatial detector that it is applied at each uh, uh, frame. We locate the keyframes, and after we detect the keyframes, then we apply the full-scale spatial temporal uh, 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 action uh, classifier. Uh, good. Okay. What is the important thing here? Do we want a keyframe classifier that has what type of characteristics in terms of the false positives and the false negatives? This is something that we did in boosting as well. So false positives are going to be the cases in which the keyframe will give a positive result and will tell, OK, apply the action classifier at this location. Yes, apply the action classifier in this location. OK. And the false negatives will be even though they are not, uh, the action is not there. And the false negatives will be the cases in which there is the action there, but it just misses it. So what do we want? What is the trade-off that we want between those two? Less of false negatives. We want few false negatives, yes. So we, uh, um, we should be willing to sacrifice performance on the false positives in order to avoid having false negatives, in order to miss uh, the action. It's understandable. Of course, we don't want uh, any you know, false positive that it is uh, uh, very, very high, because then we would end up trying at all possible locations. But we don't want that as well. Okay. And here are some of the uh, results, but doesn't, uh, they're not uh, particularly uh, important. Mm, okay. Um, yes, OK. Uh, what is important is these uh, two measures, the precision and recall. Do we know about them? Yes? Who knows? OK, good. So precision is, so recall is, the percentage of the uh, positives that it is that they are returned by the classifier. Okay, so how many of the uh, actions that are in my data set have been detected? Okay, and uh, from those that the classifier at that recall rate, okay, the classifier is also going to have a certain accuracy, and that is the precision. So the classifier said that uh, you know that those are. Uh, so that these are the positive ones. Within those, you have some true positive ones. Okay, the ratio of the true positive ones with uh, uh, in this set that was returned by the classifier is the precision. Okay, and the recall is the uh, ratio of the true positive ones with all the positives that exist in the uh, data set. Okay, and ideally, and then you see that as the recall increases, so at the point where you return where you get all the positive ones that are in the data set, then you have a low uh, 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 precision. Well, it would be very nice if you would have something that, if you would have also high precision there. Okay. Good. Okay. And uh, here I have that uh, uh, a slide to show some examples of one of the uh, uh, early data sets for action recognition. To show you the difficulty of the problem, uh, so the variations of the, uh, uh, that you have in uh, uh, clutter, in uh, viewpoint, in expressions, in appearance, in uh, uh, well, style, grayscale, and uh, uh, images, and, 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 and color, etc. Yeah. Good. <coughs> And again, as I said, 
Um, so you can extract the features, okay? You can extract the features either densely, so at each possible location, or you can extract features at the so-called interest point, so in areas that are, as I say, corners, either in space or either or, or corners in space and time. Special temporal interest points or spatial interest points, okay? There you can extract descriptors such as histogram of oriented gradients. We know the hog descriptor, right? Who does not know the hog? Good, okay, uh, fine. So what is the hog? Hog is the uh, descriptor of the gradient. Okay, so what you do is that you do a quantization of the gradient. What is the gradient? The gradient is a vector that shows the direction of the, where the edge is at that point, correct? Okay, in the same way that you made the histogram of the gradients, which were histograms of vectors that show where the edge, how the edge is oriented, you can make a histogram of the optical flow. And what is the optical flow? The optical flow is the motion vector, okay? In exactly the same way that you made a histogram of the gradients, which are texture, gra texture gradient vectors, you can make a histogram of the optical flow, so of the motion vectors, okay? And this could be the descriptors that you extract at each uh, uh, region. So the histogram within that specific histogram of that region. And then what you do is that uh, uh, that now uh, you have the so-called spatial temporal meaning in which uh, the image uh, sequence, okay, then you break it into what we have described uh, before. So you break it into uh, 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 slices, not slices, sorry. Volumes, okay. One is, and you calculate histograms in these volumes. So this is a histogram for the whole image. Two histograms, four histograms, and I don't know how many histograms are here. Uh, one, two, three, I don't know. Two by two by one, so, uh, well, four uh, histograms here in the, I think, in this uh, uh, direction. Okay, it's understandable. And then you can have recognition then uh, accuracies. Uh, what is important is the, uh, uh, and you will see that the histogram of gradient, so the texture information, depending on how many actions you have, depending on what the type of data sets you have, uh, performs uh, well by itself, but also the motion gives a lot of uh, information, okay? Typically now, as is, with the state of the art, uh, I'm going to give you roughly now some numbers. In some data sets in which you have, uh, uh, in which you get 70% getting, using only textured information, so static information, you can get around 80%, so 10% uh, difference, if you include optical flow uh, information, okay? Uh, and the evidence is that the larger your data sets, and the larger, uh, the larger the actions, the, the, the larger the number of the actions that you want to recognize, it makes more and more sense to use also the uh, uh, motion, motion information. Okay. Sorry, which eighty seven we just looked at? Sorry, which eighty seven is this one? The images. Uh, okay. So, let me see now which one is that. Uh, uh, this is the Hollywood. Uh, uh, it's called Hollywood dataset and contains uh, uh, images from uh, how do you say that? Contains uh, uh, basically uh, clips from uh, Hollywood uh, famous Hollywood uh, uh, films. Can you stands for type of pictures in, in the table? Uh, I believe yes. So this, so this is the histogram for the gradients, histogram for the clouds, and then you have a bag of four. Uh, feature uh, representation, and the bag of features is the histogram, basically, within the, and you have within the different special uh, meaning. Okay. Good. And you see also the difference, how difficult this data set was. This is the Hollywood data set, and this is the KTH. KTH was a very simple data set that was used, well, not very long time ago, but uh, 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 um, well, if you search for it, then you will see how e how much easier uh, uh, it is. It is uh, grayscale, one person in the grass field performing a different uh, action, like running, like falling, like boxing, and things like that. 
but the moment that you get into realistic conditions, then the numbers drop dramatically. Okay? Are we okay with that? So what I want you to remember now from this, from the first uh, type of uh, uh, methodologies, is that it is they are a generalization of what we did on image classification. What did we see now? We saw instead of histogram of oriented gradients, we saw histogram of oriented gradients and oriented flows. Okay, Opti an, an optical flow. Uh, we show, we, we, we have seen the uh, motion history images, okay, different types of features. We will see now, uh, uh, ah, we haven't seen, but trajectory representations are often used, okay. Uh, but again, very similar extensions of what we have already seen in the case of the uh, 2D uh, image uh, classification. And then what are the uh, recognition methodologies? Again, you instead of having the representation, you, instead of having, uh, you, you have bag of words, representations, okay? Uh, instead of having special pyramids, you have special temporal uh, pyramids, okay? Uh, what was the, for the object, uh, 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 object, for the action localization, action recognition in case of clutter, again, we could have a sliding window approach. It is impractical to do that, that's why it has not been uh, widely used. But we can go around, and I would like you to remember why it is impractical to do a sliding window approach for action localization. Okay? Are we clear about that? Good. Okay. Because of that, because of the uh, space and time uh, uh, complexity, you have to apply it at all uh, possible positions. Uh, you have to extract features within volumes instead of uh, uh, instead of frames. Uh, you have to try different scales, both in in, in in space and in and in time. Very computational complex. One way of going around that. What did we see? Is that to break the problems into two steps. So first do the localizations in space, and then at specific locations apply the full scale spatial temporal uh, action uh, recognizer. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to say anything about human uh, uh, about recognition using pose and objects. Uh, the main idea, though, is that uh, you can recognize certain actions not only by uh, looking at the person, but looking at the objects that are involved in it. And then this was a method for making that uh, in an integrated framework. So what we're going to see now here is an extension of the. Uh, 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 of the object localization uh, uh, methodology. Do you remember that with the voting? So that you vote for the center of the object, okay? For localizing uh, uh, objects. Uh, so we're going to do exactly the same for the recognition, for the localization of the actions, okay? Uh, so what we are going to have as input to the method is image sequence in which the person, for example, or the action is well localized in terms of the bounding box. Okay? And during testing, we are going to have an image sequence, and what we want to find is the bounding box at each frame, and also when the action started and when it ended. This is the localization uh, uh, in space and in time of actions. Is it understandable? Clear to everybody? Good. Okay. So. The first thing that we will do is that we will extend the notion of the spatial interest points. We will extend it to spatial temporal interest points. Do you remember what was the method for doing for for uh, uh, with the implicit uh, uh, shape uh, model? What we were doing is that we were localizing areas. Okay, uh, uh, we were extracting areas by doing a, a corner detector. Then we were seeing to which code word that was uh, uh, corresponding. And each area was casting a vote to where the center of the object, for example, is. And you would, have, you would accumulate the votes that would come from all possible uh, special points. And then where in the point where you had the most votes, then you would declare that as the center of the object. 
This is understandable. And you could have the center voting for the center of the object. You could vote also for the uh, top of the head. And then you would have like uh, you could have then a bounding box. Okay. Roughly speaking, this is what we are going to do in this uh, uh, case as well. Okay. So the first thing is to uh, detect interest points. What did we do in the uh, two-dimensional case? We extract points, okay, in areas that you had a lot, for example, a lot of information, a lot of, uh, for example, intensity variation. And how you can count that? You can count that, you can quantify it by examining the entropy, for example, okay? Or you could extract measures such as the, how uh, by, you could analyze the eigen values. Is it understandable? That's, that's what you would do in the two-dimensional case. Well, in the three-dimensional case now, what you do is that you look at a specific area, not only in space, but in time. So you're looking through a, uh, you're looking at a volume, you're looking at a cylinder. You could do that, right? Is it understandable? And then you would examine, okay, and then you would examine the entropy within that area. And in cases where you had large entropy, then you could declare a special temporal interest point. Okay. Uh, within these slides now, I am describing how you can construct invariant, scale invariant uh, interest points, but we are not going to cover it now within this uh, year. You can look at the slides. This is not something that I'm going to uh, uh, ask you in the uh, exam. Okay, and you can look at the paper and then see how we deal with the issue of the uh, 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 scale. All right, fine. What is important though, and from all of those slides, is that once you have, once you, once you, uh, what you do is that you go through the image sequence, then you examine the entropy within all uh, different uh, 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 windows, and with all different, uh, with many different uh, uh, scales, and you pick up those that are interesting. Okay, what is mean interesting that they have high entropy, and also one thing about uh, uh, so to detect the how big the window will be and how long, you're looking at how the entropy changes if you change the size of the window and if you change the uh, if you change the size of the cylinder, the diameter of the cylinder and the depth of the cylinder. Okay, and you construct a histogram like that, and in the areas and in the scales in which you have high entropy, in which you have uh, sharply uh, rising entropy, those are the uh, special temporal interest points. And uh, at that specific scale, in space and in uh, time. But okay, in one way or the other, you extract uh, uh, from the whole image sequence, you extract some special temporal interest regions, okay? that have a certain location and they have a certain extent in space and in time, okay? Within that window, you calculate, for example, optical flow or you calculate the uh, uh, oriented gradient. In any case, you extract a descriptor, okay? A vector, okay? A vector that describes what happens within that specific region. Is it understandable? Okay, that's if you extract a feature there. And what you do, is that you cluster all of those. You construct your code word. And what is the code word? You uh, cluster all those you know, vectors. Okay. And by clustering all of those vectors, then you have your code word. So far, and this is the code, uh, sorry, the code book. Okay. So you have n different uh, uh, code uh, words. Is it understandable? It is exactly the same, the same, exactly the same methodology that we did in the case of the image classification. We extracted interest points in a large collection of images, we clustered them, and constructed the code book. Okay, in this case, we extract special temporal interest points, we have special temporal regions, we extract descriptors in this special temporal region, and then we cluster them, and then we get the code book. Is that clear? The same thing, just a simple extension from the 2D case to the 3D case, nothing more. Good. And then what we do, 
is that we make the voting maps, which are again very, very similar, exactly the same as a, a matter of fact, with the 2D case of the implicit, implicit uh, shape model. Okay? So what you do, uh, let's see. So, each one of those points here is a descriptor e extracted around a uh, special temporal region. Okay? And once we do the clustering, then we group all of those special temporal uh, descriptors together and those together. Now, we have, if we have done a good job, sorry, what each one of those uh, features describe, it describes what happens within that special temporal region. Okay, it describes the uh, texture and it describes the motion within that uh, volume. Okay, and if we have done a good job in the clustering and if we have descriptive features, then those could, should correspond, all of those descriptors should come from area in which things appear the same and move the same. So if you have images, image sequences in which you have this thing and you have what and you have this thing for example okay somebody doing this i don't know why okay then what you would end up is that this one and this one and this one and this one and all of those would come from a specific point in the uh, specific phase of the action so it would come for example from this phase okay or this phase if you if you do this exercise it would come from this phase and it would correspond to my hand when we are doing that and uh, another person's hand when he's doing that it would be a special temporal volume at roughly the same location and would have the same content is it understandable okay now what happens is that for each of those regions now for each one of this phase of the action okay then what do we know because we have annotated or because we have annotated this thing during training we know in relation to that area where the center of the object is, okay? It is here. Why, how do I know that? It's because I have it annotated in the training set, okay? And I know also that the action started 20 frames before and it will end at that time after. Is it understandable? So for each one of those regions now, okay, for each one of those, I have associated to it, I have a vector that tells me where the center of the object is. Let's see this thing here. So therefore, for all this map, for all this cluster, sorry, I can construct a map like that, that has all the votes for where the center of the object should be. Is it understandable? So, I have this one casts a vote here, this one casts a vote here, this one casts a vote here, and if you aggregate those, all of those things together, then you would have this a voting map that would look like that. And what would this map then tell me? Is that if you go now during in the testing phase, okay, then you uh, and you find a special temporal region that belongs to this cluster, that looks like this cluster, okay, then where should the center of the object be? It should be somewhere here. Is it understandable? Okay. So, <coughs> are we clear how we can construct now these voting maps? Yeah? So what we do is that we cluster, we know how to cluster, okay? For each of the points in the cluster, we know we have also a voting, uh, a vote, okay? If we aggregate them, then we make this voting map, okay? Good. So now what we do, <coughs> if we have these voting maps, okay, is that during testing now, we go, we go through all the image sequence, the test image sequence. We uh, find the special temporal interest points. We extract a descriptor in that special temporal interest points. And then we see uh, to which cluster it belongs. Okay? Which code word is closer to it? This is understandable. So this is what happens during training. And this is the cluster, and this is the cluster center. During testing, I'm going to have a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, special temporal interest points. One of those, let's see, each one for each one of those, we put them in this feature space. It's going to be here. 
To which cluster is it closer? It is closer to this cluster. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to see where was this uh, special temporal interest point detected? It was detected here. Then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take this map, I'm going to put it around there, okay? And then I'm going to cast a vote, several votes, all of those votes, for where the center of the object is. Exactly in the same way that we did when we were doing uh, object uh, detection with the implicit, in, implicit shape model. Is that clear? Okay. In addition now to this voting, so I'm not going to uh, 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 expand any more on this, okay? In addition to this, we know how to localize things in space, okay? That's exactly what we are doing in this case, only we're not using special descriptors, we're using special temporal interest descriptors, and we are extracting uh, interest points in space and time domain. The second thing is that <coughs> we have also another voting map, okay? That it is a voting map for the start and the end of the action. For each of those points, we know when the action started and when the action action ended. So we can construct now for each of this for this cluster here, we can construct a voting map for when the action ends. Okay? Is it understandable? Why? Because this one now tells for this specific example the action ended after 20 frames. For this one it ended after 15 frames. For this one after 21 frames. For this one after so you have a kind of a histogram, okay? So you have a kind of a histogram that goes like that. This is the zero, this is the after 20 frames is here, and then you have a histogram that goes like that. But this is a voting map now that tells me that if I see this special temporal point, special temporal interest point that corresponds to this cluster, okay? Then I will go and I will say, well, the action, this is uh, where the action is expected to uh, uh, end, okay? I'm not going to see only this special temporal point, though, in a specific uh, uh, frame. In the next frame, I'm going to see another special temporal interest point, okay? And I, I, or several. And then I'm going to put then the voting map of those special temporal interest points. I'm going to superimpose it in that. And I'm going to add all of those things together. And I'm going then to have something that looks a little bit complicated, okay? But it's going to, how do you say, add they are going to add as time goes by, and then I'm going to detect uh, 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 the maxima, for example, in that temporal voting uh, space. Is that understandable? <coughs> Good. Yep. Okay. And this is the vo the temporal voting map as the action evolves. So this is. So what happens is that this is for where the action started, and this is the temporal map about the, where the action ends, and these are the uh, uh, localization voting maps for the center of the action, for the center of the chest, and for the low, for the where the uh, uh, lower uh, uh, part of the bounding box. Okay, and we can see the following: that in the beginning one frame, then you have several special temporal interest points that are detected. I'm not showing them here, but they are, okay? For each one of them, I'm taking the corresponding voting map, okay? And I'm putting it here, okay? And I cast the votes. For this one, I cast, I put the special temporal map and I cast votes. And if you add all of those maps together, it, something like a picture like this would emerge. Is it understandable? This now is the sum of a lot of those voting maps. Okay? Is there another one? Okay. And for each of the special temporal interest points, I'm going to have a vote now for where the act when the action started. So you have a lot that they are like here. Okay. And then you go we go to the next frame. And then in the next frame we have a special voting map of where the action is and where the bounding the lower uh, part are, are the lower uh, the legs are. Okay. But we also have, we add now to this, we cast votes that tells us where the, comp sorry, that we add votes of when the action started. And you see, you have, it was this, but then you add things about when the action started, okay? Because you have more and more votes. As the action progresses, 
then you have more and more votes about when it started. Okay? And then it goes like that, and like that, and like that, and like that. And you see here, in the beginning, you had only a single peak. But as the time goes by, then you have this one, that it becomes, you become much, much more confident to that. But you have also this and these ones now. Because the further away you are from the start, then the more ambiguous is, um, you have more ambiguity about where it went, when it, uh, uh, you have uh, different, uh, different votes as well. Okay. And the same thing is for the end of the action. And you see it better here, in which you have some votes here. And then as time goes by, then you're building confidence about where the end of the action is. And it becomes, the peak becomes more and more prominent as you approach the end, towards the end of the action. Is that understandable? Cool. OK. Fine, and these are some uh, examples of the uh, localization uh, accuracy. Uh, <coughs> okay, but now, which, let me see what time it is. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I should tell you that because it is quite important. Uh, but we have already said that in the case of the implicit uh, shape model. Those, all of those methodologies, so these are uh, curves now, the localization accuracy are similar to the curves that we have uh, discussed and that we talked when we were discussing the object localization accuracy. So what this graph says is that this is the error in pixels, okay? And this is a percentage. Uh, <coughs> what we do is that at we localize the center of the action, and we say that, well, that this frame, this is the center of the action. This is understandable, okay? But it is not the true location. It can be a few pixels further away, okay? Now, what this graph tells us is that, <coughs> is the percentage of uh, errors that we made. So this is 15 here. This is the percentage of the bounding box that have error less than 15. It says that it is 0 0.6, which means that at 60% of the cases, the error was less than 15 uh, pixels. Okay, and you make a graph like that, and you say that well, at 100% of the cases, the error was less than 40 pixels. Okay, graphs like that can tell you uh, about the uh, localization accuracy. Sorry, is that a cumulative score? Sorry. This graph. What? What are the labels? Yes, so this is the error, the horizontal, okay? So the horizontal is the error, okay? And the vertical is the percentage. So what it says is that 90% uh, of the cases, in 90% of the boxes that we have detected, yeah. the error is less than 20 pixels, okay? 100% of the uh, uh, boxes that we have detected have an error than less than 35 pixels, okay? This is a... Uh, um, um, standard way of uh, calculating localization. Uh, yeah, but uh, is that a cumulative score that, that we did in the coursework? Uh, this is localization error. It's uh, related, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, different. Okay. All right. Good. And finally, what I want to show you here is how these curves uh, change in the case that you create artificial sequences in which you occlude things, okay? These types of methodologies in which you have local descriptors that cast votes are quite robust to uh, uh, occlusions. And why? Because even if you occlude all this area here, then there are going to be certain areas that you can de detect special temporal in the response and you can extract descriptors that are pure, that are clean, that they are not affected by the occlusion. They are local in nature. So you are not going to have, or you're going to have a lot of some votes here that are irrelevant, but from those areas, the votes are going to be correct, are not going to be corrupted, okay? And that is very important, all right? So you see how the accuracy falls. This is the accuracy, the localization accuracy, the black one, if you don't have any occlusion, 
the blue is if you have 10% occlusion, the red one, if you have 60% occlusion. So you see, the accuracy falls, but not dramatically. Now, one thing I have to say is that this is about the KTH data set, which is a simple, relatively simple data set. Okay. But in general, what I have said holds. Okay. And I think that this was it. Uh, and especially for the last uh, methodology, we have a robustness to occlusion, you have fast recognition. Uh, you have uh, uh, each part casts uh, the votes uh, independently, but you don't have uh, each. Uh, that can be also a uh, uh, drawback in the sense that each special region not casts uh, things independently. So you do not try to coordinate information from two or three or several different uh, uh, locations. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Uh, these are some references. Um, Fine, 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 fine. Okay. So I would like, and well, you sh you saw that we put a little bit more emphasis on the first part, which was on the template-based uh, uh, methodologies. Okay. And I want you to remember those things. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to turn this off and log out, and I'm going to. Uh, uh, go through using this for some old example questions so that you have an idea Yes. Um, are we gonna go over like the topics which we should focus on overall? Just I'm going to give uh, the idea was to show to show you a previous uh, exam and what type of questions uh, come. Uh, I'm afraid that we cannot go through that. So I don't know what to do now. Um, could you tell us what topics we should focus on? Uh, what topics you should focus on? Uh, ah, here we are. So, you should focus on all topics. <laughs> I cannot tell you, you know, what which. Uh, uh, Topics uh, explicitly. I mean, I cannot give the. Uh, uh, no, I know, the but questions. in terms of like the weighted, like. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that you have four questions, and it goes like that. Okay, so this is something. 
for what will come, okay? And you will have four questions. And the questions are like this, for example, okay? So, for example, uh, part-based methods for object detection with sliding window methods, uh, uh, okay? That's something that could come in the in, a, in, a, in an exam. It is, uh, uh, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, so you should know for sure. You should know the bug. Of, you should know the bug of words model. You should know what is the difference between. Uh, uh, you should know which model is more applicable for object uh, uh, recognition or object detection, for example, in different applications. You should know the difference between the sliding window approaches and the bug of words approaches. The, uh, with the special structure uh, approaches, okay? Uh, and because you could have also a question like that, that uh, I say here, uh, well, basically the question breaks down, so an organization that monitors the giraffe population in a park in Kenya asks a company to design a detector, an object detector, a giraffe detector, okay? The camera is going to be on a path where several animals walk, and the giraffes often walk, uh, walk close to each other in small groups. So what should we do? A part-based object detector or a sliding window approach? Okay. And then you should think about what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of each of those methodologies. So for example, you know that the uh, template, uh, uh, the sliding window object detector, it can help, it can deal well with things that are rigid that do not have a lot of the background. It cannot deal with different, uh, very very well with very different uh, uh, viewpoints. Okay, so in this specific example, it would be a part-based, for example, detector. Okay, and it cannot. It has difficulties also with uh, occlusions. Okay, all of these things are some are, uh, 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 yeah. are, uh, are quite important. Okay, then. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I can. Uh, you can imagine what what did we talk in the last lecture? We talked about the uh, motion estimation and tracking. So I wanted to know what the, the optical flow is, what uh, uh, tracking is, what are the differences between those uh, uh, those things. I want you to know how you deal with the uh, uh, large uh, large motions. Okay. I want you to know the aperture problem. So the fact that you have two equations and one uh, one solution, okay? Uh, sorry, you have two, you have uh, one equation and two unknowns. You cannot solve. How do we deal with all that? Okay. Uh, uh, what else? I, I want you to remember to know what the drifting uh, uh, problem uh, is. Okay. Uh, and similar, what do we talk today? We talked about object recognition uh, or action recognition. I want you to know what are the main methodologies for action recognition. So to know what are kind of descriptors are being used, uh, the special temporal pyramids, uh, the histogram of optical flows, uh, all the things that we have that I have uh, focused uh, on uh, on today, basically. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Hmm. This is one. Oops. Yes, this is one example. So how do sliding window approach deal with the issue of image transform, such as scaling and rotation, okay? So how do we deal with the fact that you may have objects that are larger uh, or smaller in your test, okay? Well, you can see the generalization. Now, in the case of action recognition, I may ask you, I may ask you the same question for action recognition, okay? How do you deal with the issue of scaling? And the rotations are faster and, and the frame different frame rates on action recognition. I may ask you why it's not feasible to use a sliding window uh, approach uh, uh, there. Uh, describe what can be done during training in order to make the classifier more robust, and what can be done during testing. 
why can the problem not be dealt solely with the training phase? We discussed about that, right? We said that you can train by, we had the augmentation of the data set so that you make it uh, robust to uh, small uh, uh, scaling and uh, translations. But you cannot do that exhaustively. You cannot you know, have a bounding box and then scale such that you focus only on a very, very small part because you will not have enough descriptive power in the representation that you end up with, okay? So you have to do something like applying the detector at different scales during testing, okay? You cannot go away with, with that. Okay. Here is about the hard features. About, uh, now this is about the hard features, but what are the main characteristics, what are the main things about the, in the violent Jones and the uh, object detection with the sliding window approach? I want you to know what boosting is. What is the weighting scheme? What is the, uh, 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 I mean, I don't, want, I don't expect that you will remember exactly the formulas for reweighting, okay? But I want that you know that you have to re put a different weight to the different example. So the weight of the examples changes from iteration to iteration, and the ones that are misclassified in the previous iterations are that their weight is increased, okay? I want you to know that the classifiers that perform well, uh, the, the, the weak classifiers are, uh, that perform well are given higher weight. I don't want that you have the formula, but I want that you know the principle if, I, if, it, is, uh, if, if it is asked. Uh, if I ask you why they're called weak classifiers, I want you to know why they're, where, why they're called weak classifiers. Okay. Uh, by saying all these things, uh, it's not implying that we will come to the exam, okay? But I'm just trying to uh, tell you what type of questions are going to come. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think that I have anything um, more to say. Ah, but okay. This is another type of question, uh, so I'm saying that a company that is interesting in human behavior analysis ask you to design a blink detector. So you find out when somebody is blinking, to count the blinks. Okay? Um, this is, for example, an application of an action recognition. Uh, uh, of, of, the, of action recognition. I may ask you what are applications for action recognition. Okay? I may ask you, give me applications of, for tracking. I may ask you applications of all the of uh, object detection, okay? Describe one of them and tell me which of those, uh, which methodology is more appropriate for the specific problem. Or I may give you the application and ask you which, which methodology is better for the problem. How you're going to choose the, uh, how are you going to train, which algorithm you, you will use? How are you going to train? What are the considerations that you need to uh, uh, make? based on what we have discussed about the strengths and the weaknesses of the algorithms. Uh, okay, so explain how this problem can be solved by extending a template-based object detector to the special temporal domain. What you need to do is that examine an image, uh, how do you say that, in, uh, uh, short segments on, of uh, image uh, sequences. Okay, that's it. You have to tell me what are the representations. Ah, here it is. Describe the features that will be used, the training data, how the detector will be applied to test time. Describe possible weaknesses and strengths of your approach. So, when I say discuss possible weaknesses and strengths of your approach, well, you could say you could use now a sliding window approach and say, well, the weakness is that it's going to be slow. Okay. Uh, Yep, that's pretty much it. I don't know if you have any question. For, um, for me, but um, we didn't make the break, so we finished it. <laughs> but is it clear? Yeah. This is uh, off topic, but um, are we going to have a revision for machine learning from the first time? Yes. So you will have a revision for machine learning and you will have a revision for data mining as well. You're not going to have a revision for this lecture, for this uh, module.
And uh, the, I think that the exam is already set, right? <laughs> Anxious. And if you have sent me an email, uh, there was one somebody that sent me an email and they didn't answer to it. <laughs> to see help from everybody here, uh, but about the lecture, was there anybody? Did, did you send it to me or not? I, I, I have sent an email to you, but not regarding today's lecture. No, okay, all right. And have I replied or not? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, is there something that you want to share? Uh, what was it? Was it about the gen about some? Uh, one question was uh, related to machine learning, mach machine learning module, okay. like representation of uh, variables, like if it is scalar, vector, matrix. So, is it important in the exam how we represent a variable? Ah, uh, look. In general, as more uh, the, m the more more consistent you uh, are with the notation, the better it is. So. Uh, uh, but you cannot have bold, for example, I can understand that. So typically, the, with the lowercase, either you have scalar or vectors, and uh, with uh, 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 uppercase, you have uh, uh, matrices or uh, sets. Uh, this is a good practice uh, for you, and uh, people usually think it, uh, think, think it in this way. Uh, as long as you will clearly say what is what, if it is correct, it is correct. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to take marks off. Okay. Do, do we need to know all the, the derivations? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the machine learning, let, let's uh, leave the machine learning for the. Uh, uh, yeah, let's leave the machine learning for when the machine learning. <laughs> yeah. yes. so, uh, so we mixed up. Uh, some lectures mm. in between. Did you say you were going to update the slides and everything on QM Plus? And uh, the QM Plus now, yeah. uh, I believe is updated. Okay. I will no, I will not. I, I, I checked if it is updated. Okay. okay. So basically, everything on there. Is everything updated. on there is in, is a uh, potential. Uh yes. <laughs> and if we. Um, if us were revising, we find that there's something we still don't understand. Can yeah, you can always uh, contact me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, okay. approachable, even if I don't answer. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, uh, yeah, ask me whatever, whatever uh, it is. And uh, I'm going to be there also during the machine learning and the data mining uh, revision. So uh, after that, uh, I could. Uh, I uh, spent uh, some moments uh, for uh, those uh, for this module uh, uh, as well. Okay. All right. Oh. All right. Let's have a five minutes break then until Tony comes. And uh, ah, here he is. <laughs> Just finished actually. So. Yeah. Uh, so the submission form is not uh, Tony. You can uh, I, I think so. But there's, there, there's not going to be submission uh, for okay. okay. So it's not going to to, to come. Yeah. Don't uh, upload anything. Uh, the video lectures for last year. It is something that we need to. It needs to be arranged centrally. Uh, and it is a general uh, matter re related to the uh, strike. I had asked that it is given, but it's still, um, well, it is now beyond my control. Okay, that's all I have to, to say. But we covered everything that we needed to cover for this year, and uh, it's not much that uh, you're, you're, uh, or, uh, or is missing. All right? Okay, guys, thanks a lot. If there is anything, so Tony comes uh, now, and uh, yeah, whatever you want. If there is anything, just uh, send me an email.
very quickly. Okay, so I only have 20 minutes, so uh, I'll go very quickly. So uh, Yanis has uh, shown you some of the, uh, some example of the past year exam paper. So uh, we will make sure that uh, last year's exam paper with model answer will be uh, put on the GM class website and have a look. And uh, also you can go to the library's website to download the previous years. I don't know how many years back you can have access to but uh, so the two, three more years of exam papers. Then you can have a pretty good idea on what kind of question we are going to exam. And you probably also notice some questions uh, repeatedly appear, you know, <laughs> from time to time. So it's not like we have an infinite uh, pool of uh, questions we can give to you. So if you can sort of uh, uh, answer all the questions from the past three, four years, I'm sure you will get a very good uh, mark, let's put it this way, yeah. Um, so, if you look at the exam, there are basically four questions, and each question 25 marks. And uh, so I have two questions, questions three and four, and Yanis' uh, part covers uh, two more questions, one and uh, two. Uh, so what I do is that I quickly go through the slides. So when I stop and mention something, those topics are important for me, likely to appear in exam. So that, that's... Uh, 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 so obviously, some general concept of uh, recognition. What's the difference between instance recognition, like recognizing uh, people's face, and uh, category level recognition, like uh, separated people with animals? Uh, that's a top level uh, concept that you need to know. Starting window, you've learned uh, quite a bit. So these are the general background. Uh, so for this week, this is the first week, uh, we obviously have uh, started this pipeline and you've used this pipeline to do the coursework uh, one. And the most important uh, concept uh, uh, is uh, features, uh, image features, uh, especially histogram based uh, features. So we spend a bit time to, to discuss different histogram. And in the coursework one, I notice Maybe 20 or 30 percent of students actually didn't uh, um, didn't uh, write the code for histogram right, either for the histogram intersection distance. A lot of students actually made that wrong. Or in the basic, uh, the first step to get the uh, back of words uh, representation for the image, that's wrong. That's why uh, all the results are wrong. The computation matrix looks very strange. So histogram clearly is an important uh, uh, concept. You need to understand uh, what is a histogram. How do you build a histogram? And what's the difference between joint histogram and marginal histogram? Yeah. So if you, if you have uh, two features and each feature has 10 bins, how many histogram bins you're going to have uh, for the uh, joint histogram and marginal histogram? So in practice, what kind of histogram should you use? If you have a 1,000 feature, each feature has uh, 10 bins. Obviously, you know, you can only have one choice uh, if you want to uh, have the uh, 
reasonable dimension for the feature. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we also mentioned physical intersection uh, uh, distance. So uh, this equation is very simple. I remember also put down some examples on the whiteboard, and uh, you should uh, make sure if I give you two vector, let's say three dimensional, I ask you what is the Euclidean distance between these two vector? What is the phase one uh, intersection distance? Obviously, these two vectors are already normalized, and uh, they are phase one. What is the distance? You need to calculate the distance and give me an answer. So you need to really understand this concept. Yeah, this equation. So this uh, and the chi square, uh, chi square as well. The the equation. Yeah. Um, okay. So. So in general, for the back of uh, uh, feature or back of worst type of feature, what is the advantage? Why we want to sacrifice the information about where the feature come from to exchange for what, right? And uh, what are the pros and the cons of using a histogram based uh, uh, representation? That's an important concept, right? Because this representation is very popular. If you look at the deep learning models, typically you have a max pooling layer, some sort of pooling layer, which is some, some sort of histogram, but a cheap version. So uh, histogram is still being used everywhere. So uh, we have to understand uh, this concept. OK, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, um, k-means class string. Uh, we're actually going to look at Timmy's clustering uh, next week, I think. But uh, this is one step to build the histogram. Uh, you need to understand that as well. Um, OK, uh, I think for week one, that's, that's that. Um, for week two, So week two is about uh, classifiers. Uh, so we obviously uh, need to be very familiar with uh, nearest neighbor classifier because we use it for, for, for two cost words. And uh, we also uh, spend quite a bit of time to discuss you know, what is the K and N classifier. What is the value of K uh, if it's uh, uh, one or three and then I give you some points and ask you which point to be classified into uh, which class, uh, that kind of thing. And then we uh, spend a little bit of time to sort of uh, introduce this K concept. I believe if, you, if, if you're taking the uh, machine learning module, you should uh, be familiar with uh, this uh, concept of what is a linear objective, what is the optimization algorithm, what is the inference algorithm, uh, why we need to regularization, and uh, that kind of thing is discriminative again, uh, against generative, very top level. So what is the advantage of using a generative model? Uh, Kenya's neighbor, so remember these few examples. Uh, that's fine. Then uh, we spent uh, most of the time this week on support vector machine. So support vector machine obviously is an important concept because uh, also in course work, uh, uh, why you also have the chance to use support vector machine. Um, so this concept of uh, first uh, start with a linear classifier, then we introduce this concept of uh, max margin. Yeah, so what do we mean by margin? Now once we have the max margin, then we sort of uh, uh, introduce uh, the formulation of the uh, spot vector machine. I'm not going to expect you to be able to derive the optimization algorithm, because that's even beyond the lecture notes uh, here. Uh, what I need to understand is really what are the spot vectors? Yeah. So why spot vectors are important for spot vector machine? And uh, what is soft margin compared to the hard margin? So why we need to introduce a slack variable? Yeah. So this is C parameter. Why we have a C parameter? What is the C parameter? I ask uh, you the same question. Um, so I, I ask the demonstrator to ask you the question. Uh, when you use the LibSVM or whatever spot vector machine library, you need to tune some parameter. One of the parameters is C parameter. What is the C parameter? C obviously is the weighting of this uh, slug 
So it's how much uh, misclassification you want to tolerate for the training staking or in exchange for the robustness against the uh, uh, in exchange for robustness in the testing stage. So it's always uh, you know a compromise. Right? If you want to fit it too well to the training data, your model will be uh, quite uh, fragile when you apply to uh, test data. Yeah. Um, okay. So the concept of a nonlinear classifier. So why we need to develop a nonlinear non classifier in general. So some of data obviously cannot be separated using a hyperplane. Uh, then uh, what is the kernel trick? Yeah, the kernel trick you want to you know, uh, project the data from the original feature space to a higher dimensional space in the hope that in this higher dimensional space, the different classes are linearly separable, which means you can use a hyperplane to separate that. Then we have this kernel trick, which means in support of vacuum machine, because in the formulation, it's required you to compute this uh, similarity exhaustively every pair of training data in compute similarity. Right? So uh, people develop this uh, nice theory that uh, actually, if you give me a distance formulation to compute the similarity between the two data points, if the distance is certain formulation, is equivalent to project the data to a higher dimensional space, then compute the Euclidean distance. So that's the uh, kernel trick. You don't have to be, you don't have to explicitly design this mapping function from low dimension to high dimension because the number of parameters involved is too big. Only the only thing you care about is to have to choose one of these distance function, and people are proving that if the distance is like a uh, polynomial or Gaussian and Tar, all these distance functions are all sort of uh, uh, conforming to the criteria that uh, is equivalent to projected data to a high dimensional space. Uh, so this concept, uh, what is the kernel trick? Why want to do the kernel trick? Uh, that's important, right? So I'm not going to ask you to derive the equations, but uh, also you, I mean, you've studied this about back machine. So when people ask you what kind of a kernel you're going to use, then you need to know what they are asking, right? And what kind of, if you, if you use a, a Gaussian kernel or, or, or IBF kernel, uh, in, in other words, uh, then what's the sigma? Yeah, how, how, which free parameter you need to tune? Uh, that kind of thing, obviously, this is a uh, width of the Gaussian, and you have to tune. So, okay, so uh, week two, uh, KNN, KNS neighbor, and support back machine. KNN, you need to sort of be able to uh, understand the difference between one and three and five and, and, and give you some data points. You apply, I ask you to apply five and, and you need to give me an answer. Which point belong to which, which class? That kind of thing. Support back machine, you need to understand this conceptual level. What is, you know, max margin classifier? What is soft margin? Why we want to do soft margin? And what is the kernel trick? Yeah, so that, 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 that's, that's the uh, important concept you need to uh, Understand for week two. Uh, so week three uh, is phase. So uh, obviously you need to understand some of the concept of what is phase recognition, what is phase verification, what's the difference between recognition, yeah, one to n matching and the one to one matching, yeah. Which one is easier? Which one is harder? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so why face recognition is hard? Yeah. Uh, this is the same person, celebrity. And uh, which part of uh, her appearance make recognition of uh, her face hard? Yeah, obviously she had makeup, pink up hairstyle, different lighting condition, different view, different, uh, you know, uh, sometimes she wear glasses, uh, all this. Uh, contribute to the sort of uh, challenges we have in a practical face uh, recognition uh, system. So this actually a list of things. Yeah. Um, okay. So then we uh, obviously spend a lot of time on eigenphase, and you have a uh, coursework on eigenphase. Uh, uh, so it's very important for you to understand the, the equations. For this one, you need to understand the equations. 
you need to be able to derive the equations. Yeah, I'll give you some data points. Work first step, get mean, yeah, subtract mean, then get the covariance matrix, then do SVD or do whatever uh, to get the uh, eigenvectors. And uh, what is the eigenvector? What is the trick we we play? Yeah, so what is the eigenvector? Yeah. Uh, so covariance matrix is this equation. Uh, let's say we have uh, used some MATLAB uh, uh, library or whatever library you prefer to get the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, then what next? Yeah, if you rank the eigenvalue uh, uh, and rank the eigenvectors uh, accordingly, then you form uh, rows matrices. Yeah, so uh, these equations, you have to understand uh, these equations. You have data point, you have a data set of 100 phase, each phase is 50 by 50. What is the dimension of this matrix, that matrix, that, that matrix? You have to be very clear because those could be the questions you're gonna come across in the uh, in the exams. Yeah. So uh, the dimensions. Yeah. So I give a very concrete example: three by three images. First, the flatten them into a nine by one column vector. Right. Get the mean. Subtract the mean. Yeah. Get the mean. Subtract the mean. You get this. Yeah. Once you get that, you just get. Uh, this matrix, yeah, so what's the size? It's n squared by n squared now, n is, you know, three by three, n is three. Now, this matrix is n squared by n, n squared. Yeah, so but n squared by n squared is typically too big for you to, com to compute the eigenvalue, eigenvector. Then we see that this matrix is not full rank. The rank is actually, you know, the number of uh, training samples in the, uh, in the data. If you have a 100 by 100 uh, square image, which means you have, uh, you have a 10,000 dimension, your image, your mean, everything is 10,000 uh, dimension. But you only have 100 training samples, which means your covariance matrix, the rank, can never be more than 100. Even though your image is 100 uh, by 100, when you flatten it, it's 10,000. But uh, the rank of covariance matrix cannot be more than 100 which means you cannot have 100, more than 100 unique uh, eigenvalues, yeah? So, which means you can make this trick, remember? So this equation you have to understand, yeah? This is the only place you may be asked to derive some equations. Okay, so once you get the eigenvectors, what to do, yeah? So I have a test phase, then how, how I'm going to project uh, uh, to get the coefficients as my feature vector, then I do Kenya's neighbor. Yeah. Uh, then repetition in practice. What happened if you have a new image coming? It may not come from face because you apply a face detection algorithm, which may fail to detect a face, give you something uh, look like face but it's not face. Then a simple sort of a set of rules uh, is, is, is explained here. What if it's not face? If it's face, what if it doesn't belong to any of the person in my database? And finally, if it's a face and it's part of the uh, registered uh, people, then um, yeah, you're just doing your neighbor, right? So these rules, so this set of rules are important. Uh, okay, so what's the relationship between you know um, facial face and uh, eigen face? That's the uh, linear discriminative analysis and the PCA difference. So conceptual level. One supervised, not this unsupervised. PCA is unsupervised, right? PCA just try to find the distribution, the, the sort of direction where the data is uh, uh, most uh, dis uh, spread. And uh, LDA is supervised. Okay, uh, so that's week three. And uh, week. Week six. Uh, so week six, we look at um, uh, active uh, appearance model. Uh, so um, you probably realize that the active appearance model is too complicated. So you can imagine it's actually a bit hard to uh, to set uh, exam questions. But uh, you you still need to uh, understand this concept of uh, of why we want to go this sort of staged. I uh, first model the 
shape the people and turn face, uh, look at the appearance, uh, combine them. So this kind of concept. But uh, uh, I can't ask you to derive the equations because uh, those are too complicated. So really for this part, it's really just to um, understand this two stage the uh, PCA first. Uh, yeah, so just the, from a conceptual level, you, if you want to apply this, what kind of data you, you want? You, you need to collect some bases and you need to ask people to annotate all those key points uh, to train their uh, uh, shape model than appearance model. Uh, okay, so that's. Now I, we spend a half of the lecture on the on the regression model. Uh, so that's one area you also need to um, pay a bit attention. Yeah, so um, obviously we have Cosmox 3 on using a regression model for age estimation. So why we want to estimate somebody's age? What kind of application can you think of where we may need an automated system to tell me the age of, uh, of a person? Yeah, so uh, we have a slide to, to see that, uh, okay, maybe off license people want to uh, detect uh, uh, underage uh, customers, or more more likely, in a shopping mall, people want to profile. You know, uh, the customers coming to my shop are they male, female? What kind of age, age group they are, and how long do they do they, do they stay in certain area of the shop, and did they buy it in the end? That that kind of information are sort of a you know big data uh, error. So that's the mo most important uh, information, like the recent uh, Facebook uh, scandal. So. They are profiling you all the time. Yeah, those data can be sold for a lot of money because once they understand your shopping habit, they can do a lot of things. They can target your uh, your habit and try to sell something to you. Uh, yeah. So uh, in general, what is regression uh, in the context of our different uh, data mining method? Uh, then we need to understand the sort of uh, the simplest. Uh, Linear regression, uh, one dimension to one dimension kind of uh, re regression model. Yeah, so you have uh, x, you want to fit uh, a straight line. Uh, oh, sorry, so you, you, yeah, so the input is x, you want to fit to y, so this is a one dimensional. So this is the regression model, you have these two parameters, beta 0 and beta 1. And uh, what is the objective function? Let's say we use the uh, d square. Yeah, so this is my loss function. Uh, so you should be able to derive this equation. Yeah, this is relatively uh, simple. Uh, you just need to refresh your memory on the calculus how to get the uh, post order derivative. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, then I expand a little bit. Uh, so ordinarily square lasso, uh, you put a uh, L1 uh, loss, then read regression, you put a uh, L2 loss. As I said, in practice, if you do regression, then you know this um, this least square uh, loss is still very popular. Even in deep learning, if you look at the regression model, they typically just do a MSC loss, which is the minimum square. So it's basically this. And uh, maybe with some regularization, I mean, you, you play with deep learning two box, then you can put uh, an L1 loss, L2 loss, uh, for any layer, it's parameter you want. So this is basically one layer in the final layer of your neural network. So, um, okay, so, um, so that's the four week. Remember I also gave a one week uh, lecture on deep learning, yeah. So uh, we will have one question on deep learning. Uh, but it's not uh, very deep, so it's uh, very shallow questions. I stay at a very sort of conceptual level. Why we want to do deep learning with Anta? Yeah. So what are the motivations for people to develop a very deep neural network? Remember, I I explained to you guys why don't we go very wide, but just one layer or two layer? Why we need to do ten layer? Each layer is relatively narrow. Yeah. So they are computational reasons. They're also motivation from the human brain function, 
and how you know human mind works. They have this hierarchical sort of getting low level stimulus that uh, form into certain patterns, then then form into object, then logic, uh, reasoning, memory, and uh, so all these together sort of uh, uh, motivated uh, uh, the researchers to develop a deep learning. Uh, so this is one thing, motivation of deep learning. Second thing is that what's the difference between the deep learning pipeline and the pipeline I introduced in week one, when you want to recognize the image. Typically, in old days, you have to design a feature, choose the feature, and choose the representation. Typically, back of words, then choose the classify. Yeah, so you, you, you do this in stage. Now, with this uh, deep neural network, we do it in one stage. What is the advantage of doing one stage? Yeah, as I said, it's because it's jointly optimized. Yeah, the feature is optimized by, uh, for the classifier. The classifier is also optimized based on the feature you learn. Everything is learned end to end from image all the way to the final class labels. That gives you some advantage. So that concept needs to be, uh, uh, be clear in your mind. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, go into uh, uh, details in the question, ask you, for example, you know, what is, uh, I'm asking what is the typical algorithm people use to optimize. What is the algorithm people use? Not at that level. I mean, in general, Rose algorithm is called stochastic gradient descent, right? So we're doing gradient descent, but we're doing stochastic way, which means we do it in a mini batch way. We accumulate the gradient uh, over many, many, you know. So stochastic gradient descent is the answer. Basically, if you put that three words, then you get that one. You don't need to go any further, you know, what kind of uh, stochastic gradient descent. But typically, uh, neural network is, is optimized using stochastic gradient descent, either in the original form, or in some more fancy form, people develop uh, over the years, the many different variants of that. Yeah. So that kind of uh, level is, I may ask a simple question, is that, uh, what is pooling? Why we need to do pooling? That, that, that kind of thing. We said it's because we want to reduce the uh, dimension of the feature map, so the network will become more manageable. Okay, any question? Either regarding to my part of content or the exam format, that kind of thing. So my suggestion uh, to you is that uh, and these are the general guidance I gave to all the students. First, you answer the question you are most familiar with, you are most confident with. Don't stuck at one question. And time shouldn't be an issue for this module because most of the questions really ask you to, to write a small few sentences to explain some concept. Um, so, but still, you want to uh, finish the question, you know that you know the answer for sure first, rather than follow the exact order, I have to finish question one before I can tackle te question two. You just uh, quickly scan through the questions, and if you're like, okay, question three, I more or less know the answer, I'm starting from question three, then go for it. Yeah, don't, don't need to stick to the order, yeah. Uh, that's first thing. Second thing is that uh, um, make sure that uh, you, um, you write the answer uh, very clearly, uh, don't use fancy handwriting. Make sure that uh, uh, the uh, us, basically, Yannis and me, can recognize your handwriting. We don't care how, how, how beautiful your handwriting is. As long as uh, we can recognize that, that's fine. Second is that to be concise. So you do see a lot of students, they tend to write a very long essay for a small question, which was three marks, read, read very long. Uh, that has a negative I impact because uh, uh, for us, the the people who mark your exam paper, we're really looking for some keywords. Yeah, we have uh, the number of keywords we are looking for. If we can state that keywords, then we're happy. Yeah. If you have a written a very long one, we have to read it for five minutes. Then that put us in a very bad mood. Then we become very picky <laughs> on small things. Yeah. So a good practice that uh, try to be precise and concise, and also highlight uh, those keywords. If the question is. Uh, First, ask a yes or no question, then ask explain, then first, yes.